Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Black Tower podcast. We're going to steamroll straight through this intro because our favorite little Danny boy has the pipes calling over on another oh, show. Danny boy, you're here in like your 20 minutes. Calling. <laughs> Indeed. So uh, I am, of Hi, course, your I'm boss, John Mahale. He's Let's that all guy. do it at the same time. And then time. there's the other guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm Andrew, your boss, John Mahale. I'm joined I'm by my two fantastic Mahale. hosts. That's one of them. And I am Daniel, your Am and Can Mahale. Am and Can. And whenever you see my mouth moving uh, in the YouTube video, but you don't hear anything, it's because we talk over each other and I got to cut myself out. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. So that's and why. You definitely I don't need to cut yourself out. That would be sad. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, yeah. I mean. cut out the audio. Put in a big sensor beep so nobody hears either one of us. <laughs> there you go. There you That's go. the best version of this. You know us. We are the Black Tower Podcast. We are a Wheel of Time podcast. We discuss all things Wheel of Time. Past, all of it. Present, future, an age that is past, an age that is, and an age that has not yet come to be. If it's Wheel of almost. Time, there we three will be. You just rhymed to be with B, and it Shh. really pissed me off. <laughs> Well, you know what they really say. Better to be off. pissed off than pissed on. Uh, unless truth. Um, speaking of so, being really pissed off, though, there are some yeah. people who are the opposite. <laughs> I mean, that is yeah. true. But we will do plugs and everything at, at the end of the episode. So some of you say yay, and most of the rest of you also say yay. We're going to go <laughs> ahead and get your protection rolled on for the spoilers that are sure to come. So here is your Black Tower podcast spoiler warning. This is your official spoiler warning. Oh, this episode word. contains spoilers for all 14 books and the prequel. If you are still listening and you haven't read all these, you want to be spoiled, don't you? Ooh. Crave it. Getting spoiled without oh. putting in the work? Well, get ready. Here it comes. Ma'am, you have no right being that attractive. I'm just saying. Mommy? Sorry. For those of you who don't know, that was Ada Lorna Sedai from the North Harbor podcast. They are absolutely amazing. They recently had London Rivers on their show. Correct. So go check it out. It was a great episode. It was really awesome. The esteemed so, actress, not to be confused with the actual Rivers in London. Yes. No. Wait, they, they didn't not. just have all of the water in the London Well, that was rivers. a previous. It's, like, it's just the sound of running water over the entire <laughs> podcast. <laughs> that was that was a previous episode. That's their <laughs> intro. That Maybe was it's the not episode actually running that water. They did. That's what they did when they did the episode on land. There was just a lot of wetness. Just the whole time, it was just so much wet. Oh, wet. <laughs> So, speaking of things that piss you off, and uh, since Daniel has to run, because he's got a deep discussion to have, he and Brother Dan from The Way of the Leaf are going to go so deep. We're going to go give Twat Cast the D. We're going we're gonna to make sure that the Black Tower gives, gives Twat Cast the D. We're going to give them the full attention. When the black the tower. tower stands fully around. Uh, that's right. <laughs> um, no, but uh, we were talking about things that piss us off. Things we absolutely hate about the Wheel of Time. And now I will say with qualifiers, Gawain is an easy target, so he will not be as hey, a character. Don't, <laughs> don't throw caveats on there. I'm not saying I was going to use that, but you're not Caveat allowed to just out, say it's that. Out there. It's out there. It's a given. It's that's low hanging fruit, my friend. I mean, yeah, and you know what happens to low hanging fruit? It gets, it gets kicked during a soccer game. Probably that too. I can guarantee. Are Jack you fucking Black, sorry? Jack Black and Kyle Gass come get it when they're looking for a snack. Yep. Those. But anyway. So three uh, moments you hated about the Wheel of Time, Daniel, before you have to run. Yep. All right. So my top three most hated moments in the Wheel of Time are as follows. Uh, the very first time that Cad Swain ever meets Rand. I absolutely hate this moment. She is such a horrible person. 
when this happens. Uh, and I, again, she goes ahead and gives you her reasoning behind it. And I'm not saying I don't agree with some of the thought processes that she has, but it's such a horrible exchange in the wheel of time. And I really hate it. Number two uh, is Fail killing Masima. I actually really, really hate that moment because she has been expressly told not to. Uh, she has had a conversation with Perrin about it. She knows his will. She knows different things. And she even pretends to agree with him to a certain extent so that she can just then go behind his back to do it and just straight up mercs Misima. Horrible. I hate it. I hate it so much. Uh, and the last one that I, that is in sort of my top least favorite moments is when Rand bail fires the entirety of a city. Um, I get why it's important. I absolutely understand that it is his uh, Luke moment in the swamps of Dagobah. Uh, it is his, I at this moment am so close to being a member of the shadow, basically, that there is no difference. Um, but it is such a horrifying event. Um, it is. And it feels like it didn't need to happen. Um, it feels like him thinking about it. Would, and would you say it feels it, senseless? It feels senseless. Yeah, it does. It feels senseless. That is a good word for it. It's also somewhat punny, you dickhole. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's it it is it's rough. Uh and so again, I, I I'm not saying that I can't see some merits to it. And again, all three of these scenes have some merit to them. But unfortunately, they're just so detestable in the outcomes, in the process, in whatever you want to call it, that those are probably my top three most hated moments um, in The Wheel of Time. All right. Yeah. That's fair. So. Fair enough. I dig it. I dig it. So cool. Now uh, I'm going to just drop that. You guys can talk about it or not talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm off to go jam the D in the podcast. All right. You enjoy. So Thanks. Give them our love. I will. Definitely. In, in both ways, I guess. Yes. Oh, oh, I, I thought you just meant the one. Okay, cool. I'll definitely do both then. <laughs> All right, no. guys. Have a great recording and I will see you again soon. <laughs> See ya, buddy. Bye. Oh, okay, bye. Okay, now that he's gone. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So those I don't, are I found okay. myself like I find myself with a little bit of difficulty like thinking of these things, to be honest with you. Um because there's there's different ways you can look at it. Do we look at it from outside the source material, looking at what was, or not outside the source material, but out of the world of the Wheel of Time, and right, looking at right. things from the implications they had on the series, the writing style, the methods used, and uh, the themes used? Or do we look at it from inside the world, things which, that were just terrible? I mean, uh, And some of them, can we even separate it? That That's actually a really good point, though, because... Um, I, you know, I use the example of Gawain earlier and Gawain is someone who behaves very, um, in character for the way his character was written. He's very on brand. Um, he doesn't, he doesn't like, uh, you know, love Rand one moment and then hate Rand the next moment just to provide convenience to the storyline. Um, so do we hate Gawain? You know, when we talk about moments that we hate or things that we hate, are we talking about Gawain, even though he's operating perfectly within the story structure? Or are we discussing things that don't fit? And we kind of go, wait a minute. What? Why? Why? What? That's a, that's a tough one to, to bring in. Um, yeah. and even then even then I find I do find mo I do find difficulty finding moments that I just 
hate. Um, yeah, well, I mean, uh, there. I think there's some that we can agree on off of, like off the bat, um, that are just intrinsically heinous within the story, uh, and also without the story. I'm not saying it's only bad in the story. Um, so the forcible bonding, uh, whenever it happens, I think most people would agree. Is, you know, it's, it's relatively hated. You know, it's heinous. Um, even in the series, uh, it's described as tantamount to uh, trigger warning for any victims of uh, sexual assault, but uh, it's tantamount to rape. Right. So, uh, and we see it first with Rand, with Alana and Rand. And it just, it, it leaves you feeling just almost ill whenever you understand how how much of a terrible act it actually is and that that theme of incredible uh, betrayal of peoples and disrespecting uh, of people's on wills and bodily autonomy and things of that nature is a relatively common thing that happens in the series if we're going to include the forcible bonding along with uh, with scenes of actual assault. Um, right. Because we have Alana and Rand. And then we have uh, Ravine or Lord Gabriel and Morgays. And then we have uh, Morgays and Iman Valda. And then you have the forcible bonding of the Tower Sister sent to the Black Tower by the Ashaman. And then you have this kind of pseudo bonding uh or this like not retaliatory but um trying to make things right bonding of ashaman by sisters from the tower where the sisters from the, the tower or the rebel eyes to die or both i think at this point actually uh because they're reunified um come back in and are told pick an ashaman and bond him you know this is this is compensation yeah. for what was done to you and it's like no uh compensation would be like oh i don't know how about fucking releasing them that's a thing that you can do and yeah. um doing your best to say sorry enough which you never will be able to but you know taking a stance and adopting law uh and order that prevents you from doing the same practice ever again you know recognizing how terribly heinous it is and you might be able to throw that under the uh, under a partial blame, if not almost entirely under the blame of Rand, because that would be another yeah. thing that I hate. It. And it's not even a moment; it's a series of moments where Rand uh, essentially abandons the Black Tower to its own devices. Yes, because that's what allows Taim to to do everything he does uh, in the series in regards to the Black Tower to start turning people to have his own faction to enact the forcible bonding. Um, to do all of these terrible things that had Rand just shown up, especially as a person that has been a victim of forcible bonding, could have shown up and stopped knowing how heinous it is. So, yeah, I went from a moment to a whole ideal tirade. No, no, yeah. no, you're good. That's, I mean, that's exactly what we're here for because that is, and, and you know, you can't talk about forcible you know, relationships or forceful bonding without discussing, you know, Matt and Tylen. And I, I think, by the way, just focusing on the conversation thus far, um, we're going within the story. <laughs> oh, yeah. Piece, bits of the story that just made us go, what the fuck? Oh, that sucks. At, oh, at least for this. now. At least for now. At least for now. But no, um, that you can't talk about force bondage or force uh, force relations without talking about Matt and Tyler, um, which Robert Jordan himself even came out later as saying, "Yeah, I originally just wanted to, you know, flip the coin on its end. You know, there's all the stories about dudes flirting with, you know, barmaids and and dudes coming on to women that don't want it and things like that. And I just really wanted to make it an uncomfortable situation for men, you know, or, or not for men in general, but for Matt and to kind of give you a sense of what that situation is like when it's been flipped on its head and it's in the reverse and to kind of poke a finger at it and say, look, 
you know, this is a bad situation. You flip, you know, you got it one way and everybody goes, oh, that's just the way it happens. And then you flip it around and everybody goes, oh, you can't do that. And it's like, that was the original intent behind that entire interaction. But then he even says later that he definitely agrees that, you know, it got way more intense <laughs> than he than he ever intended for that to be. But was still happy with the final product because it did open up that conversation. And so, yeah, yeah that's, that's a part of the story that um, I'm not going to lie as a, as a, you know, as a young kid reading that, I was like, shit, I'd love it if a woman tied me down and, <laughs> but you know, as, as, as maturity, as I have become more mature and I use that word sparingly, don't quote me. I'm not a mature person. I'm going to put that quote on the front of the website somehow. <laughs> Shit. As, um, I'm but as, a, as, a, as I've grown as a person, how about that? Um, it's, it's, it, is, it is a much more difficult mm. uh, scene to read. And I will say, you know, as far as the goal of, I want that to be a topic of discussion. I want that to be something that people discuss. It worked. It worked 100% for me because now I look at those situations and I say, you know, I, I, I largely have that interaction to look at situations and go, okay, but what if it were the reverse? You know, you, you have all these situations where, well, it's okay because it was a woman doing it to a man or it's okay because it was a man doing it to a woman. Okay, but what if it was the reverse? If it was the reverse, are you now horrified? Cool. Then it's not okay. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. And I think that's the the main, whether intentional or not, um, and I think it was definitely at least to some degree intentional, that that is one of the most important parts about uh, the Matt and, and Thailand scenes is it forces people that may have not considered things in that manner to look at it. And uh, just like you said, if you flip the situation around, are, are you horrified? So if you look at Matt and Thailand, and you're not horrified by what Thailand does to Matt, well, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, <laughs> but if you're not horrified by what uh, Thailand does to Matt, but you are horrified by what uh, Ravine or, or Lord Gabriel does to Morghese, or even Valda does to Morghese, or what Alana does to Ren, or any of that, then you should be as equally horrified by the other, because these are all equally heinous acts. They're different profiles. They're different um, spans of time for sure within the series. But irrelevant of that, they're still absolutely horrendous actions for, for people to do to others, fictional or not. And I think maybe as a younger child reading it, uh, a lot of people, myself included, are just kind of like, okay, this is you know weird. And it's really easy, I think, to fall into the kind of thought process with Matt and Thailand that... Well, you know, Matt's been running around flirting with all these people and flirting with these women and, you know, pinching barmaids on the bottom, which is still bad. Don't fucking do that. Um, Don't do that. But it almost seems like, oh, well, the, the tables have turned on him. So let's see how he likes it kind of thing. And it, it, it comes to a, an almost feeling of pseudo justification that he's now having to deal with being on the receiving end of that. Uh but I, th I think the bigger picture of it is it makes you, if Thailand and Matt are the only thing that make you uncomfortable in those situations, it makes you think or should make you think right. about more gays and Ravi. It should make you think about Alana and Rand. It should make you think about more yes. gays and Eamon Valda. It should make you think about all these other situations where either the same thing or something that is culturally considered to be the same thing is happening. And it should make you uncomfortable because I think in a big way, Robert Jordan wanted to bring a lot of these conversations to the forefront through fantasy. And some of the points where fantasy resonates the most with anybody is whenever it hits those really real elements. There are people that have, that have dealt with this, that have lived with this and they're like, maybe not the bonding, but this forcibly being tied to somebody without your... Uh, without your willingness, without your consent, without anything of that nature. And it's it's meant to be jarring. It's meant to be horrifying. 
And the, the conversation even now still rages uh, in different groups between about oh. Thailand and Matt. Because you're going to have a whole group that says, like, no, it's not that. It's just, you know, some kinky fuckery. And it's like, I don't, <laughs> I don't understand how anybody could think that way. Well, and that's, and that's why I say flip it, reverse yeah. it. You know, everybody wants to say, well, Matt's been a flirt this whole time. Okay, I'm not condoning his actions, but he's been a flirt. He has never once held a woman at knife point and had his way with her. But see, I say that and you go, God, that's terrifying. That's horrible. Absolutely not. That should never happen. Yeah. And I like what, what Matt Stagger said here in the live chat. Flirting and tying up are, are not necessarily equal. If you're that's into true. that, then by all means. But that's something you've discussed with your yes. partner and y'all have kind of agreed upon. Because uh, I tell you now, if, if that's something I decide that I'm into and you go and get the scratchy ass rope from the barn, I'm going to be pissed. They make Japanese silk rope for a reason. Go and buy it. It's nice and soft. Um, <laughs> this is going down a weird tangent of... Of, of personal <laughs> <laughs> but bari rope hold on hold on let me <laughs> yeah yeah um but but yeah and I, I think it's definitely not the only thing that robert jordan includes um that may not be so obvious at the forefront or maybe it is uh, i i think it's fairly obvious as an older reader now um, and I was even reading it in my my mid teens. So right. uh, at that point, I was you know mentally developed enough that I think I picked up on what was going on. And you know, it, I think it does make you look back at some of the other situations and kind of reevaluate your reactions <laughs> to them, or look more at these other situations like Ravine and and Morgays because it's also very subtle. It's way more subtle with with Lord Gabriel and Morgays uh, right. than it is. Right. It's, it's heavily implied. But the scenes aren't played out, which makes it easy to, to overlook, um, which is why rereads are, are so great. And I think, um, you know, tantum are almost necessary for the Wheel of Time, because you're going to miss every, some things on the first read through. So go back and read it. But it, it does, like, those situations become more obvious later on. And uh, there's, not, there's not a single one of them that I like. Um, <laughs> yeah. I vehemently disagree. Uh, Thailand and, yeah. and the Grom deserved each other. So <laughs> making making the real statements here. Um, as far as but I would just say the same for I, anybody doing that. So do you know? Oh God! As far as moments that I hated, um, I'm going to say this with a fair amount of caveat because. I hated it as I was reading it, but then when the Deus Ex Machina happened and everything was saved, and the day was saved, it was a scene that I now absolutely love. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to add the caveat that I hated it while I was reading it. And it's the scene where Rodel Aitoralbe is in the city the shadow spawn is taking street by street, coming for him, and he's going. And he has this moment of reflection where he's just like, you know, I'm an idiot. This guy appears out of nowhere, tells me he's the dragon reborn, tells me he needs me here, says he's going to send me support. And I listen to him like an idiot. And he talks about how every instinct is telling him that he needs to retreat. But he can't. He's stuck. And it was so hard to read that, that sort of, that sort of um, conflict that uh, Rodell was having. Because as a first-time reader, I thought he was dead. I really did. And, and he was a character that I loved straight from his intro all the way to his you know all the way to the to the you know the story's end for him i i i love rodel Aitoralbe. he is my favorite great captain and i'll say that hands down 
So as reading, reading, and I can't remember the city that he was in, but you know, they, they've been holding off shadow spawn, holding off shadow spawn. They get to the city gates. The, 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 the dude won't let him into the city gates. And when they break into the city, the dude says, well, now I'm going to put you on trial because you brought a foreign military into our city and that's punishable by death. And it just, oh, I hated it so much. But again, it was within the story. Like it was very uh, appropriate for the story. And I think they found out later that the head of the city was a dark friend. I'm pretty sure he was. And his job was to basically make sure that city got slaughtered so that the shadow could use it as a as a stronghold. Yeah. And then they end up, I'm going to look up the city now because I'm pretty sure they end up using that city as a stronghold. Uh, You're not talking about Camelon, are you? No, I'm not. Talking, it was a Borderlander city. It was oh. up in the Borderlands. And he had retreated, retreated, retreated. And they 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 got to the, the city. And I'm looking for the city now. He's in, is he? he received a maradon in the city of maradon and it's essentially his last stand he he he, and just reading that whole exchange reading that whole internal conflict him holding maradon as long as he can and just how beaten and battered and bloodied and bruised he is at the end of that siege I was a little upset. <laughs> I was a little upset because that's that's kind of what helped. That's that's that's. I mean, again, you know, we we talk a lot about you know PTSD and trauma and things like that. And uh, Ida Rolde definitely had some PTSD after Merida. Like, absolutely, hundred percent, no questions asked. Um, but that's kind of the fuel he used to launch an all-out attack um, against the Shadow Spawn in the last battle. I mean, a lot of other guys were being manipulated, and he was kind of one of the last holdouts because of his PTSD, because he hated them so much. <laughs> and I, 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 again, so like I hated it as I was reading it. As I was reading it, I hated it because I was like, he's going to die. Uh, he's going to die. And I believed he was going to die at Maradon. And it was very upsetting for me at the time. So there's, there's one of my moments. Yeah. Um, hmm. It's one of those things, like when you think of a topic, you can think of all these moments and then you get here where it's actually time to talk about it. And you're just like, Hudder, brain no work. <laughs> um, hmm. It's especially difficult to do in a series that you love wholly. Yeah. Like, and that was so well written. You know, they talk, it, <laughs> I I love so much, you know, because we've talked about, you know, in the Age of Legends, it was men and women channeling together that accomplished the, the greatest feats, the legendary feats of the Age of Legends were accomplished by men and women working together in perfect harmony. And I, I, I have to wonder how often uh, like Robert Jordan and Harriet like giggled at each other like this book series is so awesome because we're working together. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I, I do have another moment that I absolutely hate. Right, go for it yeah. because my, my brain is deciding it's time to blink. <laughs> It must be the, the good food I had before recording. Ruark. Ruark deserved better. I'm, yeah. Oh, Ruark deserved better. He, For him to be just the most amazing badass that he is and to just come up and be all under Hesalam's spell, no. He deserved better i absolutely i hate that so much and then and then how he died oh 
<laughs> I hate it. I hate it. I hate it thinking about it right now. There are a lot of those moments in the last battle, really. If you if you kind of focus your mind on the last battle, there are a lot of I hate it moments in the last battle. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Ruark always deserves better. Because he's such a he's such an amazing character. <sighs> yeah. Um so let's go for one for a reason that I don't necessarily hate for for in for what it contains in the series, but for what it doesn't contain in the series. And I'm gonna go with portions of the negotiations around the dragon's piece. Mm. Um the absolute lack of explanation to the reader for some of the motives for why characters make the arguments they make uh, for or against, you know, the dragon species for or against that drives me insane. Um, because it, it allows it allows for readers to be so focused on the things they hate about certain groups or entities to where it it passes by why the decision in the moment it was made was abundantly necessary. Um, and uh, there's a there's a lot of hatred for Rand not forcing the Sean Chan to give up all of their demonic, which I which agree is I abundantly share. terrible. Yes, is abundantly terrible. And I'm but so it's... glad you. That was the other one. I'm so glad you popped into it. Yeah. Um. And I'm not saying that people should accept it or or think that it was the right decision. Because uh, it's it's definitely not. It's a situation where there is no right decision. Um, you're taking an entire culture as as horrible as aspects of their culture definitely definitely are, and expecting them to be forced to give up what is a core and central part of their culture in one fell swoop. And no culture ever uh, in American history, in world history, uh, in fantasy history has ever ever done that. Uh, a change to a culture takes time and it takes work. Could a lot more have been done to start pushing that work forward? Yeah, abso absolutely. Um, well, but you, but you got Rand in a moment where he's stuck between like the biggest rock and the biggest hard place because he's been told their support is necessary to yeah. win the day, as well as their inclusion in the dragon's piece. That without them included in the dragon's piece, that the dragon's piece will not last long beyond his death. So um, he fulfills part of the purpose of the dragon. The dragon reborn is supposed to make the decisions that are going to result in him being hated amongst certain groups. And as terrible as it is, it was for Rand the necessary decision. It definitely could have and should have been done differently. I swear to Jeebus or whatever deity you may or may not believe in, if you're taking what I said out of context that I thought he made the right decision, <laughs> you're wrong because I'm not. But what I'm saying is I can understand him prioritizing having a massive, well-trained and highly successful fighting force on the side of the light guaranteed to save the world over prioritizing morality of of a culture because if the world doesn't exist then yeah the horrible parts of their culture is gone but so is everything else everything else is gone there's no time or there's no ability to work on it whereas yeah. by Rand doing what he does the world is saved the Shan Shan are included in the dragon's peace they are by treaty banned from uh, from accruing any more Damane and it puts them under the purview of policing of the I.O. And it was already inevitable that the Sean Chan culture was going to have to see that what they thought was true about their Damani and Soldom was not the reality that they thought it was. That the Soldom can channel. Right. As well as the Damani. And so by their own standards, everybody would have to be colored. And if you have nobody that can, that can control the... Uh, the Damani and the Adam callers, 
well, then how do you maintain a, a horrendous practice like the Damani practice? Well, you can't. So you have to make a massive cultural change. Yes. Uh, which I believe is inevitable. So condemning the action, absolutely. Saying it could have been done better and handled better, absolutely. However, I, I can understand because Rand's priorities were saving the world versus ending, you know, what he's ending always, all uh, of the uh, problems with the world. Yeah. Well, and I and I could even I could even make a case for why that's a thing that we can hate about the books within the book space. Like, okay, I I get it, and and I also hate it when people like guys like slavery is bad like everybody knows that anybody who does not know that is they got something they got a they, you know a couple fries short of a happy meal like i get it okay nobody's condoning slavery even rand was like he tried he tried by force and said give up all your domane and i will kill you and she was like tuan was like yeah yeah that's not happening like that's not how we run business and it it gets me because he had to make an extremely difficult decision of fine you can keep your demane but any of them who want to leave must be allowed to leave and tuan in her arrogance was like <laughs> Of course, but they will not want to leave. And, you know, maybe they don't. Maybe they've been mind broken to the point where they really have no desire to leave. It doesn't justify what they're doing. But when you are essentially the savior of the world and you have to make a decision and you've tried to force someone into doing something and they've withstood your will like you know what are you supposed to do he had to make concessions in or he had to he had to let the little fish go so that they could catch the big fish later okay the little fish being demane the big fish being the continued existence of existence now, don't get me wrong. You know, there's a little fish that's this big, and that is, you know, um, my roommate borrowed my car and didn't fill up my car with gas. And this is a little fish that's this big, okay? And then there is, uh, you know, my roommate never does the dishes. Then there's, you know, that's a little fish that's this big. And sometimes you let that little fish go, okay? Slavery is very 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 big fish okay but it's bad it's a very big fish but when compared to the size of the continued existence of all things i mean my arms aren't long enough here andrew like reach out your arms and let's see if we can make a big we can't make a big enough fish for the size of the continued existence of all things. So I hate it. I hate that at the end of the story, there are still Damane. I hate that the Sean Chan are still allowed to continue that practice. But without that, there would be literally no existence. There would be nothing because the shadow would have won and they would have destroyed everything. So all three yeah. peoples are still alive because of that exchange and there is potential to see future progression and who knows in that hundred years you know we, throughout human history we see time and time again uprisings and and you know where education becomes a part of a population where education where people are educated in 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 better practices uprisings happen people say well wait a minute we're being treated poorly no 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 you're not this is this is the way our culture does things this is the way our society does things no <laughs> this is the way you do things culture and society don't do these things 
and and people learn things and you know now there's room for growth and maybe in Sean Chen there's a lot of people certainly uh, a lot of recently collared demane will have the opportunity to be released and hopefully you know the education will reach to the furthers of society and that practice will be ended that's my hope i think it's going to happen i mean i i agree <clears throat> and i hate that that had to be the, the way it went sorry that i'm not like looking at the camera or looking focused i'm having to do admin stuff in the discord because somebody decided that it was appropriate to step way out of line um oh. Uh -oh. Yeah. But anyway, um, I hate the scene because it it wasn't written in a way that explained how terrible of a decision Rand had to make. Like, he sighs and he's like, I don't like having to make this decision. And that, that's about it that we get as an explanation for why Rand ha makes the decision in the way that he does. But I also hate that that had to be a decision that had to be made whenever it could have just as easily been written into the books where we could have cut back on some scenes that we didn't need as much book content about. And we could have seen the unraveling of the institution of Demane in the Sean Chan. When it comes out that, hey, everybody that holds the controller end of the, of the Adam, yeah, you can all channel too. And so by Sean Chan law, you should all be collared. Well, now we've collared everybody that even stands a chance at, you know, controlling Damani. Well, what do we do? Well, we have to change things. We have to fix things. Um, and that is, that is the long and short of it. So I, I hope that everybody that was listening to that understands what, what we're saying, uh, that we don't condone it by any stretch right. of the imagination. Well, and and there's a massive, the whole... massive difference. Uh, between understanding why something was done and being okay with much less condoning what was done and that's so, that is the that's the the whole spirit of the topic tonight is yeah. things we hate <laughs> things yeah. things we don't love about it and and uh you know we realize it's not our normal cheery topic <laughs> But, but, you know, we want to talk about all aspects of the Wheel of Time. And then there are things that are just uh, less pleasurable than others. But I think, the, I think the fact that even having the ability to have this kind of a discussion makes the Wheel of Time that much more prolific, makes the Wheel of Time that much more amazing because... You know, there is balance in all things. You know, without love, you cannot, you know, without hate, you cannot appreciate love. Without anger, you cannot appreciate happiness. These are still, you know, these, these, are, these, are, these are hallmarks of the human condition. These are things that we need in our lives. Um, now, can someone express anger in a negative way? Absolutely. Does that mean anger is negative? No. Um, can someone express love in a negative way? Absolutely. Uh, does that mean love is bad? No, it doesn't. It means it's a part of who we are. It means it's a part of our experience as a human. And I think the fact that there are parts of the book that make us go, oh, oh, that's terrible. That's bad. It's what gives us more depth and more appreciation for the story um, so this discussion is a good discussion to have i in my opinion because it, it helps highlights it helps accentuate why this story is such that we can have a podcast about these books for three years and going strong and it's about to celebrate our fourth year uh, here in a few months like we're about three and a half years of doing this and we're going strong we're not even close to running out of topics to discuss and there are several hundred other content creators doing the same thing we're not running out of material anytime soon it's because we love this series so much and we need to talk about the things that are not 
perfect, that are not happy and that are not brilliant uh, in order to appreciate. And it's like the example I gave of Rodell at Maradon. You know, I hated it. It was sad. It was tough to read. But as a result, Rodell is one of my favorite characters. Um, Talmanis has a, ser- a similar story in Cameland. You know, defending the city, trying to get people to, to stand with him. And you've got all these mercenaries that are like, yeah, we're not being paid. Fuck you, bud. And he's like, you dead if you don't. Um. It, it's so frustrating that even in the face of complete obliviation, these people will still be like, Meh, I don't want to. Meh, I don't need to. And this, this, but it's what makes the story of the Wheel of Time that much more prolific. It's what gives it that much more flavor. Um, I love it. it. I love that there are parts that I hate as weird as that is to say does that make sense i feel like i think it does because like it makes so this is one of the things we talk about with the characters why some of the characters if not most of the characters work so well as they do because they are believably humanistic they are believably flawed they believably make mistakes and errors in judgment and um You can believe the mistakes they make. And a lot of it is enabled by us being able to read the thoughts that they have and why they're thinking along that train of thought. And it brings this this kind of avenue where you can kind of understand what's going on in their head. And that both enables you to approach what's going on from an understanding standpoint, but also to have a more well-rounded viewpoint of it whenever it's something that's still wrong or you don't agree with. No. Um... Daniel mentioned before he left the uh, Fael assassinating uh, uh, Masima. Yeah. Yeah. Almost said Masana, but yeah, Masima. <laughs> uh, you can definitely understand why she does what she does. But it, at least in my opinion, uh, and it sounds like Daniel's opinion as well, and I think we've kind of all agreed on this before, that her rationale doesn't warrant the action. It's not a suitable enough justification for it. Like, oh, my husband is too kind of a person to do it, so I'll just do it for him. Or, you know, he's not the kind of person that'll just get blood on his hands because it just needs to happen. And, uh, uh, no, uh, no, no, me gusta, no thank you. (laughs) Like, if you're you're going to commit murder... And you're going to betray the trust of somebody that you say you love. Like, at least have better rationale than that. Yeah. Like, your heart might have been in the right place, but your brain should have been in the right place, too. Come on. Or or at least own up to it afterwards. Like, yeah. okay, again, I'm not condoning lying to your significant other and going behind their back. However, should that happen... Should you accidentally go behind someone's back and you know and make a mistake, own it. If you are of the opinion that you know better and you decide that you want to act on their behalf because you know better and even though that they said specifically not to do that, you're still going to do that because you're smarter than they are. Weird thought process. Own it afterwards. Because to me, one of my things is living intentionally, okay? If you're going to make a decision about anything, one way or the other, own that decision, okay? Nobody else made you make that decision. You made the decision, which means the consequences that go along with that decision are yours as well. You can't make a decision. You can't decide to do A and then cry that you don't like how that turned out well, then you should have not made that decision. That's, that's, that's how these things work, okay? So for Fail to go against Perrin's wishes and make sure that Masana didn't, or Masima, I just did the same damn thing. Masima doesn't see the light of another day. Okay, I, I don't even disagree with the decision itself. Masima was batshit. Like the dude had no good qualities. 
And the only reason Rand said bring him to me alive is because he had gained a following and Rand needed that following. But Rand had no idea what that following was. And Perrin was not smart enough to see that this following was a bunch of rabid animals. And Fail recognized immediately that Masima needs to be put down. She went against Perrin's wishes. She agreed to them and said, nope, I agree, husband, you're correct. You know, we will deliver him to Rand and let Rand figure that out for himself. And then as soon as Perrin wasn't looking, she was like, fucking kill this bitch. They kill Masima. And then she goes up to Perrin. Oh, I don't know. He, he must have disappeared. It's weird. No. If you're going to do something like that, own it. If you can't own it, you shouldn't do it. Period. End of story. That's fair. I mean, because we, we talked about that whole thing before and that, you know, it was very likely that, and I think Rand even mentioned that uh, when he finds out that Messina has been killed uh, under Perrin's care, he becomes very angry with Perrin, uh, if I remember correctly. Yes. And he's like, I had, there was a bunch of fervent followers that I could have had, not because I want people to follow me, but because we need fighters for the last battle that is very right. very fucking close right and if Messina had convinced all these people to follow him because he's speaking on behalf of the Lord Dragon and the Lord Dragon comes down and says you're wrong you're batshit crazy and you're going to be hung or you're going to be executed because of what you've done then yeah you're going to lose some followers who are going to have their like you know, their followership and their faith shaken because they thought they were following, you know, the just thing. But the fact that it was the person they were supposed to be, you know, worshiping that did it um, could have preserved a lot of that fighting force rather than scattering it and making them, you know, potential rebels and everything. So, which I think they did become like kind of like roving yes. bandits of sort. Yeah, they did. So, yeah. So, so now yeah, instead it, of what should have been like a, a fair solution and uh, or a problem that could have been turned to a benefit for Rand, it just became like an even could bigger have been problem. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think Davram Bashir could have like whipped them into shape pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I don't know. It's just it again. It's just another one of those things that it's like. Well, and we we've discussed this time and time again on the show where the books part of the frustrating aspect of the books is that you know in a story like this you have the savior of the world who comes up and says oh i love this and everybody should follow to this banner and we should all do this and save the world and everybody goes yes it's the end of the world everybody rally to this banner and let's go save the world and it's like okay cool we like that it's fun you know, there's a bit of a journey to it, but there's always, there's always an aspect of, okay, you got to go on this quest and get this item. And then once you have this item, all these people will love you. Cool. Now you go to this item. And once you have this item, all these people will love you. Cool. Now that you've gone and done this thing and you bring back proof that you completed this feat, the people will love you. And now we're good. And now everybody can join up together and call it a day. Um, in the Wheel of Time, this and this, I guess this is kind of a love-hate thing. In the Wheel of Time, you know, you've got prophecy that's passed down that people say, oh, whoever gets Kalendor is the Dragon Reborn. And Rand goes to the, the stone of Tyr. The stone falls. He pulls Kalendor out of the air and he goes, oh shit, I'm the Dragon Reborn. And the Aiel say, oh yeah, by the way, we're the people of the dragon. And everybody knows that the people of the dragon have come to the Stone of Tear. The stone has fallen, and the dragon has pulled the sword out of the air. And then the fucking the Lord, the High Lords from Tear are like, "Okay, but that didn't happen, right? We can just pretend like that didn't happen. We can do that. We can do that, right? Yeah, we can do that. Cool, cool. Yeah, no, that that was a fluke. That doesn't count." Uh, that wasn't the actual prophecy. That doesn't count. Yeah, I mean, and it's so like there's another. It's it's just an annoying part. I mean, it's it's written into the story, and it adds conflict and everything. But it's always annoying when you have a group of people that are in power, and they have very obviously 
lost. And things are very obviously not the same by their own standards of their own world and their own culture. Um, which is shaky, I guess, when it comes to Tierra, considering their whole ban on anything to do with magic. But it's like, how could you not see how wrong you were? Like th- th- those parts are like they're they're not necessarily the worst parts, but they're incredibly annoying because it's like you were all literally in the stone. You all essentially saw this happen with your own eyes. So either you're right. self admitted batshit crazy and unfit to rule or or lead or whatever. Or you're just so absorbed in your own your own idealistic fantasies of your power to where you refuse to let any of it go. Because they have to acknowledge that that Rand has a ton of power as a Dragon Reborn because to his face they do everything they can to satisfy him. But I think they're also the only group where people essentially formally abandon Tyr to go and set up an opposing camp with the sole purpose of fighting against Ran and reclaiming control of Tyr without being intrinsically dark friends. So it's, it's kind of like the Elida thing, but Elida cranks it up to 10 and does it all herself. <laughs> Whereas uh, the High Lords that make up this rebel faction uh, of High Lords are just doing it because they're power hungry and they don't want to see their loss of power. And I think there is a part of it where they're like, well, the reign of the dragon is temporary. Yeah. Because they're, they fully believe that he's going to be successful, but because Tyr doesn't embrace magic or doesn't allow for magic to, to exist within its bounds as much as it can, even though it definitely does. Um, they're just like, well, all we got to do is convince him to leave and leave us alone uh, like we've wanted everybody that can use magic to do forever. Right. And it, it skews their judgment so horrendously horrible. Do you know, you know, what's interesting about that, too, is, you know, Robert Jordan wrote this series on the premise of uh, self-preservation, right? Self-preservation takes, is, is an aspect anytime you start talking about prophecy, anytime you start talking about these kinds of scenarios, there is an aspect of self-preservation there. Uh, someone isn't going to just jump up and say, oh, right, yes, I'm the savior, let's go. You know, they're going to they're gonna do just like Rand did and fight that. And that, that's true for anybody. So when the dragon comes, the destroyer or savior, nobody really knows which one. There are a lot of people that are going to be like, yeah, we haven't seen Shadow Spawn in generations. Like, I think we're good. Um, uh, we're good. You know, thanks for coming by, Mr. Dragon Reborn, but, you know, we're good. The stone has never fallen anyway, so we can just hang out here forever. Like, we're good. And so it... it, it They treat them like so people stereotypically treat Jehovah Witnesses. Like, you know, the, I mean, the stereotypical joke of like, you know, hey, do you have a moment for me to talk to you about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? And, you know, you get annoyed by the people that ride up on bikes knocking on your door, you know, <laughs> <laughs> early or late Saturday or Sunday. Go away. I'm hungover. Yeah. No, and they kind of I mean, treat anybody that can use magic the same way. Anybody that has any relation to anybody that can use magic the same way. I'm pretty sure that just because the white uh the white cloaks are hyper fixated on the Aes Sedai, that Tyr turns away white cloaks just for that pure fixation on people that can use magic. Right? It's the same. <sighs> yeah, no, it's 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 interesting because. Again, you've got that you've got that self-preservation thing. You know, the, the High Lords in Tyr are not they're not looking to save the world. They're looking to preserve their position. They don't want someone coming in and saying to them, hey, this is how we're gonna do things now. They're like, no, we've got a system in place, we're good with it, and we're cool. We're like we're good. We don't need anyone, especially no backwoods hillbilly coming at us telling us how to do. Yeah. Well, let's let's try to put uh, a happier spin, I guess, uh, on the tail end of this episode. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to be frank with you. Those of you that are listening live, I don't know how much of what you heard is actually going to make it into the actual episode. Um, <laughs> I tend to be very hyper vigilant in the way things are portrayed uh, just because I don't want to deal with people uh, listening 
I uh, make the joke all the time that people only listen to 60% of what you say before making their mind up on what you were trying to say. Yes. And uh, yeah, I, I know I don't have the desire to deal with it and I don't want uh, anybody else to have to deal with it. So there may be portions uh, of this episode that are cut out just for the sake of Would you of say not uh, having to deal 40% with that. of the portions were cut out? People could only hear about sixty percent of what yeah. we're saying. There, there might be like there might be a fair a fair <laughs> part of the Sean, of the Sean Chan discussion that's cut out just because I know what's yeah. what's going to happen. Yeah, um, and yeah, that's predominantly what I mean. Because um, I know what's going to happen. It doesn't matter how much we clarify exactly what we mean. Uh, everybody's going to pause at the second they think they hear what they think they hear, and then it's a whole shit storm that. I, just I wouldn't say everybody, like but there are there are definitely. Well, was I, did I say everybody? You did, you did. Oh, but sorry. you said it colloquially, and I, I understood what you meant. And and I'll say that a fair portion of people, people knew what you meant. Yes, but there are there are certain people out there who they listen for what they want to hear to justify what it is they want. But but again, that's what we're talking about tonight in the wheel of time. That's what people do. They listen for what they want to hear. They justify what they want to justify. And in the end, they end up creating a reality that they're most comfortable with. And that's only a problem when it's in direct conflict with some of the the constants of the world that they live in, which is Shadow Spawn are coming. I mean, you can sit here and complain all you want that the Dragon Reborn is making you be nice to commoners, but you're this far, you know, you're it's 11.59 on the Doomsday Clock, buddy. Like, you do what you gotta do, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And that might be one of the most frustrating parts of the series. It's like, how quickly in the series it becomes clear that, like, it, the end times are nigh. And it's not just some crazy guy on the corner with a cardboard sign. You know, leading up to, oh, what was it, 2012 with the Mayan calendar? Yeah. Um, it's very clear signs that are very well studied and published. It's like, hey, all this means that. Um, which, again, is presu- presuming uh, a wide uh, acceptance of the more philosophical aspects of the Wheel of Time across the different nations, uh, which seems dubious in some areas at best. But it is incredibly annoying. It's like, yeah, there's no way like the world is ending. Uh, a gray mist just showed up in the middle of your rebel camp, and people are dying just by being touched by it. What do you think that probably means? So, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. But um, let's see. Um, hmm. Ways to make fun, funny spins uh, towards the end of this for things. Um, obviously, a lot of the the terrible parts that we hate about Gollum gets wrapped up by the end of the series because he, you know, kind of takes care of himself. Uh, obviously, to the detriment of Egwene, which he knows will happen and still says, I still know best. I'm going to do what I want. So that is beyond annoying and beyond problematic. It's like, fuck you. I don't care what you think. I'll just yes. do what I want. <laughs> oh, God. Dude, you know, okay. And I'm going to throw it out there. And I know it's probably going to get it out. But I don't care. I'm going to say it anyway. Um, oh, that's some hesitation least, right there. At least the Sean Chan have generations of tradition to go by. Gawain literally just goes, I'm going to do this now. And then he just does it. And everybody's like, dude, you're the dumbest guy ever. Like, why are you doing that? And he's like, because this is what I do. And they're like, okay, dude, like, chill. Like, what's, you know, okay, bro. Like, but you know, you're consistently making the wrong decision at every turn. Shut up. Rand killed my mom. Oh! Cool. Bro. I'm just saying there's a reason why people collectively hate him worse than they hate the Shang-Chi. 
I mean, he also nobody's has, excited like, generations... for the Gowan casting, except for maybe you know John from What Up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he has generations of, of of tradition and culture to fall back on, and deliberately steps away from it. Like he is the sworn first sword to Elaine, and after like book what three four. Pretty much says, no, nah, fuck that. Right. My only allegiance yeah. is to Elida and the White Tower. Oh, nah. But then he like spends the entire time being like, where's my sister? Where's my sister? I'm the sworn sword of my sister. Where's my sister? And it's like, bro, you done cast your lot. Yeah. Deliberately against, well, not deliberately, maybe against his sister, but if you're the if you're the the sworn a sword to to your sister who is you know the the next in line for the throne and she's literally looking at you and telling you I know for a fact Rand did not kill mom Rand is not the evil guy Elida <laughs> is an evil manipulative piece of trash and Egwene is the only true Omerlin and you still go nah fam fuck you <laughs> you're, you're kind of a I, he's such a bro about it too like I could totally see him being like nah fam nah it's good yeah yeah from Chad to straight up dude bro in a few books yeah oh god but he does he does he really does because he again he he sides with Elida for for no other reason than Swan wouldn't tell him where Elaine was. That was it. He didn't even side with Elida because he thought she was right or that she would do a better job or anything like that. He sided with Elida because she wouldn't, because Swan wouldn't tell him where Elaine was. He's a conspiracy theorist. Yeah, he is. Swan wouldn't tell me where my, where my sister is. Neither with the rest of her cabinet of leadership. She also heavily supports Rand, the dragon, who I've heard Therefore, killed my mom. She must die. Yeah. I mean, it, it's this like really weird, narrow minded, slippery, slippery slope train of thought that just results in him just fucking up after fuck up after fuck up after tiny redemption after fuck up after fuck up. And that's and I think I think that's again I think that's one of the things that gets me is that Galad gets redemption eh, a little bit, but he does get some. He does get some character progression where he gets to grow and accept the fact that, oh, okay, Rand is not bad, people who channel are not all bad, et cetera, et cetera. Um but Gollum, man, he's just the same dude from book one just the same dude over and over and over again and it just mm. it really grinds my gears it really grinds my gears that, that's a great way of putting it yeah. um alana i think her whole situation well yes oh okay sorry with gawain yes that he never learns from his mistakes he never finds any reason and, and he never believes he makes any it's especially frustrating like when, because when he Egwene was hops trained. all over his ass for, yeah. for almost thwarting her plans. He's like, Well, this wouldn't happen if you just told me your plans. And she's like, I can't. I can't. Because tell you're you my so plans, pretty, dipshit. but you're so dumb. <sighs> Not but, only that, but he he was mentored and raised by Gareth Prince. Gareth Bryn knows like how to, he's one of the great captains for crying out loud. He understands duty. He understands responsibility. He understands all these things. And so he's trained Gawain from a very early age. And Gawain still has like no ability to be like, Hey, um, maybe I should talk. He even gets a chance to talk to Gareth Bryn. Like he even gets a chance to talk to him. And Gareth is like, why are you shirking your duty? 
You have one duty. You were given one duty from birth. It's the only thing we've ever trained you for. Why are you not doing that? And he's like, oh, I didn't want to do that uh, because now things are different and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, You've got your mentor literally looking you in the eyeballs and saying, you're fucking up. And he's like, no, I'm not because reasons, because I'm, I'm okay with that. It just, mm. he, he has, he's a, he's an example of a person who has every chance to correct their mistake and be better and chooses not to like actively chooses to not be better, chooses not to learn. Even when people are told, you know, even, even when he was told straight up, you fucking up, you are not doing right. You are being, you are in the wrong. And he's still just, he just, he just can't do it. He can't, he can't, he can't be self-reflective and, understand what he's doing incorrect this is true it's it's, it's which, fun that we have <laughs> go ahead i was gonna say which is an important part of character development both in a book series and in real life you're like oh as a person yes i made a mistake i should learn from that and be better but instead certain people like to double down and just lock into a course of action that doesn't gain them anything close to what they want. Well, and, and it goes back to, you know, what I was talking about earlier. If you're going to make a decision, own that decision. Like, but a step further than that is remember the consequences of that decision. And do they only affect you? Gawain is a prime example, of, a primo example of someone who does not take into consideration the consequences of his actions and how those consequences inevitably will affect someone else. He allowed himself to be bonded as a Gwaine's warder, knowing the effects of the bond, he went off on his own. Like, bro, you are the warder of the leader of the White Tower. You don't get to just go off on your own and do shit. You have responsibilities. Your life is no longer your own, of your own accord. You have responsibilities to other people. You can't make decisions that will affect them without talking to them first. Sorry, that's period, end of story. That's how my life is. That's how everybody's life is. That's what you do. I can't go out tomorrow and spend all my money on strippers and booze because then my family no longer has a place to live because they can't pay rent. Not that I would go out and spend all my money on strippers and booze. <laughs> there are other things I would definitely spend my money on. Though. Well, there's definitely other things that you can spend your money on. <laughs> Car parts sure. being one of them. I mean, if you spend all your money on car parts or computer parts, you know, then you can't get into a more unsavory habits. I got the uh, I got the Falcon to turn over today. I didn't get it to start, but I did get it to turn over. Hey, that's progress. It is good. It is good. It is progress. So, yeah. Um, but you know what? We should probably do our plugs. We should probably do final thoughts on things we hate about the Wheel of Time. Do our mm. plugs. Call it an evening. What do you think, Andrew? I, I think that sounds good. Um, the only final thoughts I have is all, all of the stuff that we hate about the Wheel of Time accentuates the hell out of all the things we love about the Wheel of Time. And... Oh, and in my my little opinion, take it for what it is. And if you don't care about my opinion, then why are you listening? Uh, no, <laughs> but if you don't care about my opinion, then you know, fine. Feel free to feel differently for sure. Um, 
is that they all serve as points of illustration for, for things that either were serious issues and for the most part still are serious issues uh, in the lives we lead now. And they, they help call attention to those things in the books. They help to serve as illustrative examples on how to look at things differently on how the most terrible decisions can uh, be understood and still regarded as absolutely horrible. Um, that no decision and no track is guaranteed to be abundantly correct, to be abundantly right, and to be a, uh, abundantly uh, moral, I, I guess is the word I was looking for. I, I forgot the word I was looking for halfway through the sentence. <laughs> but, uh, but in the end, uh, they all provide avenues for redemption uh, in one way, shape, or form. Some that we get to see in the series and some that we don't. Yep. So, and uh, I think that's what part of what maybe Robert Jordan was getting at that sometimes a hard choice is made to enable survival and later redemption. And we may never get to see if that redemption actually happens or not. Right. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of my final thoughts, I guess. Uh, my final thoughts, I kind of touched on it earlier um, with my story about Rodell and Maradon. Um, the things we hate about the story are things that accentuate the highs. You know, the lows of the story accentuate the highs of the story. And without those moments, without those things, you know, it's just real difficult to appreciate the victories and appreciate the the uh the the celebrated moments in the series because you know you can't just have a if you had a story where everybody just wins all the time and everybody's happy all the time it's a boring story any D, &D campaign you know it <laughs> it's no it's no fun if you only roll nat 20s the whole time you have to have some ones you have to have some successes and some mild successes and some unsuccessfuls and it, that's what makes the story great um and so i think robert jordan understood this really really well um and i think as a result we have a superior story out there in the world today and it's really really great so um thank you all for being here it's it's, it's been truly uh truly fun to talk about i think i think it's fun every once in a while to talk about some of the deeper topics um, some of the, the little tougher bit topics, topics for sure. Tougher, tougher, tougher. Yeah. Um, the deeper and tougher topics. Like, tougher toppers. Like a well done steak at the bottom of the ocean. That's right. That's right. It's that's deep right. and it's tough. That's and right. I don't enjoy it. I mean, <laughs> I enjoy getting together and talking about the Wheel of Time, but um, it's really easy to spend all of our time talking about the really happy topics or the really fun topics or all that other. Yes. Uh, but it is also equally a disservice to not talk about the problematic things and, uh, you know, the, the issues that surround them. So hopefully that's what everyone takes away from this discussion. Um, we'll see. Uh, hopefully it, it, it at least makes you think about things in different ways that maybe you didn't consider before for a more rounded opinion. But uh, some place that you don't have to find a more well-rounded opinion to go to because it is a pretty great place to go to is blacktowerpod.com. That is our home for all of our stuff. You can find our episodes there. You can find merch shops there, the Discord invite link, all of that kind of fun stuff, as well as a link to our official channel or show or whatever you want to call it sponsor. The Crystal Barista has a fantastic rock hounding uh, chibi made by Memo Art. Go and check out crystalbarista.com. Thecrystalbarista.com, right? There's a the. Uh, I don't think there is. I think it's just Crystal Barista. Oh, you're right. It is just crystalbarista.com. But you know what? You don't I have am. to worry about if there is or isn't a the. Just go to blacktowerpod.com and click on the cheapy for explore, sure. collect, and repeat. And go check out everything over at the Crystal Barista. Fantastic for all of your mineral, rock, and gemstone needs, as well as your own rock hounding supplies. Uh, what was our other plug for today? Watcon? Uh, Watcon. Yeah. Um, 
Another place to go, WattCon.com. More information is coming out about WattCon in the relatively near future. So keep your eyes out on the WattCon official social media, most of which is called WattCon official. So go and follow the uh, WattCon official on Twitter, on uh, TikTok, um, Instagram, all of those fantastic places to see and get more information about WattCon. We're going to be there. You should be there. We look forward to seeing all of you there that can make it out. And if not, we hope to see you next time. But that's all of our plugs done here at the end of the show. Uh, but anyway. we hope you have uh, enjoyed this episode. It's a tougher episode. It's a more serious episode. But every once in a while, you just you got to get elbow deep into a topic and, I don't know, try not to throw up the whole time. Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. We hope that uh, you have enjoyed uh, in it taking on your weekly dose of taint. Um, and we hope that you leave this recording just a little bit more insane than you were when you first came. <laughs> uh, from the remaining uh, recording members this week from the Black Tower, I have been your sort of on the hill, Josh. I have been your Bajon Mahal Andrew. Your Omicron Mahal Daniel is uh, here in spirit, but also physically over there with TwatCast uh, talking about the D. So going deep. Uh, going deep into the D. So if you haven't watched it by the time you're listening to this, go back to TwatCast and watch their dive into the D section of the Wheel of Time Companion with Daniel from Black Tower Podcast and Daniel from uh, the Leafcast or the Way of the Leaf. That's um right. but uh in honor of Daniel, of course, as he always says in these episodes, um we hope you fa have a fantastic morning. And in case we don't see you again, good afternoon, always good evening, and good night. In the tower, you can bring your pain. In the tower. So much trouble just fitting